um, our effort with the North American Megadam Resistance Alliance, also known as NAMRA for a few years. Um, we have uh, been doing work to try to persuade the um, Northeast uh, governors and Eastern Canadian premiers to at least listen to our message and um, did so that again yesterday. Um, over the last three years, we have gone to their meetings um, either yesterday by Zoom or um, by um, outside the meeting hall. We have not been invited in, though we have requested to do that many times. Um, so we're trying to, you know, get information out to everyone about why we are opposing the um, this um, CMP transmission line, and um, and why, as particularly Canadian Hydro, is not the answer to climate. Um, so we have a roster of speakers tonight. Um, Meg Sheehan, from who's the coordinator of NAMRA, and then uh, we will be hearing from Amy Gould, and we will be hearing from Steve Brooks, who's a registered Maine guide. Amy Gould is an Inuk member, community member from Labrador, and um, so I'm uh, just happy to have all three of them and thank them very much. They will introduce. They will be introduced by Meg Sheehan. Um, as a, a matter of protocol, uh, we will take questions in the chat box. Um, and uh, it, so please put them in the chat box as you're going along. There will be time for questions and answers in the end. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And let me introduce you to Meg Sheehan. Meg is a coordinator of, um, as it says here, <laughs> she's a coordinator of North American Megadam Resistance Alliance and a, a NECAC corridor mod and the corridor moderator for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Meg. Um, and uh, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Becky. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak tonight about Hydro-Quebec and the dams in Eastern Canada and where this electricity is coming from and the impacts on people and the environment in Canada. So NAMRA is an ad hoc alliance of groups and individuals. Our mission is to protect rivers and their communities by resisting mega dams and their transmission corridors. So I'll be talking about Canadian hydropower focusing on Eastern Canada, but the story is pretty much the same across the country. Over the last 100 years, Canadian hydropower has destroyed hundreds of thousands of square miles of land and river systems destroying river ecology, biodiversity, water quality, altering natural river flows, causing erosion and flooding that continues to, to this day as a result of the operation of the dams. There are artificial, massive artificial reservoirs behind the dams that operate like storage batteries, holding back water and causing its temperature to rise until distant metropolitan areas need to turn on the lights. The dams trap sediment that would otherwise flow to the ocean, thereby negatively impacting fisheries and undermining the ocean's ability to store carbon. Dams are a safety hazard to those living downstream. The flooding and flow alterations of the river systems makes it impossible for indigenous communities and people who have followed traditional fishing, hunting, and gathering livelihoods and trapping um, over millennia. It prevents them from being able to do this and causing causes in food insecurity, as you will hear from Amy Norman. Canadian mega dams poison the environment and wild foods with me methylmercury. Ironically, Canada is one of the most water-rich countries in the world, but many of the indigenous communities living near these dams have no clean water due to the degraded nature of the river systems. The hydroelectricity that Hydro-Quebec and Nalcor Energy, its sister corporation in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, embody Canada's legacy of colonialism, state-sponsored violence against people and nature, racism and discrimination. Under these policies, most of Hydro-Quebec's vast hydropower empire has been built on the ancestral lands of Aboriginal people without the consent of the people who use those lands for millennia. 
They were built without environmental impact statements and the largest dams that were built back then in the 1970s are still in use today and part of the export supply that Hydro-Quebec is trying to sell as clean, green and renewable. It is anything but. It's a climate and humanitarian disaster. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of the scale of what we're talking about, the vast areas that I'm talking about are in sub-Arctic regions of northern, uh, east, northeast Canada. You can see the distances um, on the left-hand side. You can see James Bay. That's where one of Hydro-Quebec's largest dams is located. That was built in the 1970s. These transmission corridors go 1,200 miles down to Boston and New York. Over to the right, further east, you can see the Churchill Falls uh, Dam that was built also in the 1970s. That is a massive dam that has a reservoir that's the size of the country of Ireland. Next slide. Hydro-Quebec operates a system of 63 mega dams located throughout the country. One of them is not shown on this map, but it's located on the border of um, Quebec and Labrador. That's again the Upper Churchill Dam and that's relevant because I'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Tonight I want to focus on what has been happening the last few months with regard to Aboriginal resistance to the dams that are being used as an export supply for Hydro-Quebec and that it, you know, this is the electricity that's being called clean and green and renewable. Several of our prior webinars have focused on why this is dirty energy, why it is not a climate solution, how two of Hydro-Quebec's largest dams that are still in use today, 40 years later, have greenhouse gas emissions on par with fossil fuels. So I won't go into that, but I really wanted to focus on what is happening with some of the smaller communities whose lands were stolen for this hydroelectricity. So I'll be talking about Aboriginal people. That includes First Nations, which are not all Indigenous people in Canada are part of a First Nation. Some are sovereign nations. There are also Métis or mixed, Canadian and or settler and Indigenous people and Inuit. These people are speaking out against the exports of hydropower stolen from their lands by Hydro-Quebec. Report after report describes the environmental racism connected with the hydropower development across Canada the last 100 years. Recent letters and submittals from Indigenous community members to U.S. officials calls this systemic racism, discrimination, and cultural genocide. And I want to point out that I'm not trying to speak this evening for Indigenous communities um, about the ones that I'm going to talk about briefly. Those folks were invited to participate in this conversation, but most of them are, um, do not speak English as a first language, nor do they, do they speak French. They speak their Indigenous languages. They look, live in remote areas, um, most, mostly along the North Shore of the St. Lawrence River, which you can see here um, where this dam cluster is um, north east of Montreal. So first of all, um, we have the Inu Nation of Labrador in Maine. They submitted comments to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection they are the group that are impacted by the Upper Churchill Falls Dam. It's the 10th largest hydroelectric generating facility in the world. That's the one that has a reservoir the size of Ireland. Amy Norman, our speaker here tonight, lives downstream where the second dam has been built, Muskrat Falls. The Inu of Labrador have sub submitted a declaration from their tribal chief describing the fact that one sixth of Hydro-Quebec's electricity supply that it's exporting to the US today is clean and green is unlaw unlawfully located on their lands. The Penobscot tribe of Maine joined them in July in requesting that the US Army Corps of Engineers require an environmental impact statement 
for the New England Clean Energy Connect corridor, citing two reasons. First was the impact on the main environment, which harms Penobscot lands and fisheries, but also because of the second, uh, second reason being the significant impacts on the Innu Nation in Labrador. The, this declaration and the supporting um, information from the Innu Nation is in our resource folder. Uh, associated with this webinar and it's quite devastating. There are photographs there that describe the um, manner in which the hydro dam operations continue to erode cultural sites of the Innu Nation, including washing away the ancestral graves of people. The second significant development, next slide, sorry. Um, Okay, I will um, diverge here, but I want to acknowledge also the Cree and the Inuit. Um, this is a book that I would highly recommend reading, Strangers Devour the Land by Boyce Richardson, if you would like to get a sense of what this vast primeval uh, land looked like before Hydro-Quebec began its um, hydropower development in the 1950s. It talks about how people were living off the land and actually had no idea that this was going to be happening. And these are some of the people today who um, are trying to see, uh, have their voices heard. The book is primarily focused on the Cree um, of the more Western part of Quebec province. The folks I'm talking about tonight are located more to the East, as I said, on the North shore. So next slide. Um, Three First Nations from Quebec in August of 2020 wrote to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That would be the um, Wei we Motashi of Akademek um, First Nation, the Wei Motashi, uh, whoops, the Innu First Nation of Pesimi, and the Anishinaabek uh, First Nation of Pico Johns. So. These are, folks are located, as I mentioned, on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River. They're all based in Quebec. They have urgently requested that the Army Corps deny the New England Clean Energy Connect application for the Clean Water Act permit. They, have talk, they talk in their submittals about how their communities were dispossessed of their lands by the government of Quebec and Hydro-Quebec with the consent of the government of Canada, and they outlined how there are 21 production structures, some 10,000 kilometers or 3,800 square miles of reservoirs, tens of thousands of kilometers of transmission and distribution lines and new roads that were illegally installed on their traditional territories. These infrastructures are still operated by Hydro-Quebec in violation of rights recognized by the Constitutional Act of 1982 and the 1996 ruling of the Supreme Court of Canada. So they are saying that they will not stand by in silence while Hydro-Quebec financially benefits from their heritage. And 33 of the 63 production facilities of Hydro-Quebec are built on their traditional lands without consultation and without compensation. In other words, Hydro-Quebec is trying to sell to the United States stolen goods the scale of the profits that are going directly to Hydro-Quebec is astounding when these communities, as they describe it, they live in impoverished conditions with some of the lowest standard standards of living in the world. So Hydro-Quebec makes $2 billion a year of profits that are funneled directly to the province of Quebec to support the central government of the province. That's because as you may know, Hydro-Quebec is a crown corporation. It basically is the government of Quebec. It doles out benefits to indigenous people. In other words, reaping these profits off of the stolen land and then turning around and giving out uh, token benefits to the communities. As far as the profits that will stem from the New England Clean Energy Connect, Hydro-Quebec will make nearly 500 million in the first year send it selling electricity uh, via the CMP in Maine. It will make 12.4 billion over 20 years. 
there's a similar corridor going through New York, and so you could double that number. A van grid, the parent of CMP, will make 60 million a year in profits over 20 years for a total of 2.9 billion to operate CMP. So that's um, the social and economic injustice uh, that NAMRA is concerned about. And that is why for the last two years, as Becky mentioned, we tried to bring these frontline voices to the conference of Northeast governors and Eastern Canadian premiers because Hydro Quebec is there promoting its electricity as clean and green and trying to win political support for these two transmission corridors that are now currently active the one, and proposed, the CMP through Maine and the New York corridor. And we uh, firmly believe that, you can go ahead and flip through the slides while I'm talking, but um, firmly believe that this electricity has no place in a clean new deal and it really is not clean green. Um, and you will hear more about that. Here's our petition to uh, the governors and premiers, and we had over 500 uh, signatures on that peti petition from community members who live with the impacts of this hydropower production day to day. So thank you, and I will turn it over to Amy Norman. Um, she will be talking to us about her experience as an Indigenous woman and community member in Labrador that was in who's impacted by that second dam on the Churchill or Grand River. Thank you. Haley, hi. Hi, my name is Amy Norman. I'm uh, an Oklahoman, born and raised in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador. Um, so way to the Northeast. <laughs> um, I'm going to be chatting with you a bit about what my community has been through um, downstream of these kind of giant mega dams and kind of what that holds for the future. So, <clears throat> I'm Inuk, so my family and I are Inuit, um, the circumpolar indigenous people. We, yeah, we're from. Labrador. I was born and raised here. My mom's family is from Newfoundland. My dad's side of the family is from Northwest River and Maine in Nunatsiavut. I've been with a group called the Labrador Land Protectors um, since about 2016. That was kind of when the the resistance movement to the to this mega dam really kind of boiled over. Um, and the reason for that was this large study that was done um, in partnership between the Nunatio government, so that's our Inuit self-government, with Harvard University, uh, their School of Public Health, and they looked at the issue of methylmercury contamination um, caused by this dam. So methylmercury is a harmful neurotoxin and it can cause um, what's also known as mini mata disease. So it can cause all kinds of issues from um, numbness in your hands and feet, developmental disorders in children, memory issues, um, issues with hearing and speech. Um, so it's, it's really, really this horrific thing if you have um, too much methylmercury exposure. Um, and so mercury, naturally occurs in all vegetation and when the vegetation is submerged in water that's when it converts to the harmful methylmercury form um, and this is particularly harmful to us as Inuit because our traditional diets um, it's very fatty very rich in fat and methylmercury like as a molecule it builds and builds and builds so bioaccumulates in fat um, so you might not have, you know, very high levels in the water, but as, you know, the plankton and the tiny critters um, get eaten by the fish and then the larger fish eat those fish and the seals eat those fish and we eat those seals and it, we are getting all of that mercury from like every level um, to the point where the levels are up to 10 million times higher 
in uh, fish and marine mammals like seals uh, than the water that they live in. So, you know, as Inuit, we're often called seal people. That's who we are. We, um, you know, we have for millennia been, you know, hunters, gatherers, but especially on the coast of Labrador, we really rely on seal for everything. It, it's, um, you know, not just a, a source of like rich, healthy food. Um, it gets all of our vitamins and minerals. Like we don't have as, that much vegetation in the Arctic, but you know, we can still get like all of our vitamin C from seal liver and stuff like that, right? Um, it's our clothing. We use the oil for our lamps. Like it's, it's long been, you know, this source of everything. Um, it's essential to who we are. And to have something in our backyard that's, you know, but contaminating this, it's, it's severing, you know, our ties to not only rich, healthy food, but also to who we are as a people, because it is such a spiritually important um, connection. Uh, so yeah, we still rely on hunting and fishing and harvesting. Here's a picture of me and one of my nephews with some pretty teeny fish, but it was a great day. We caught other ones later. <laughs> um, and you know, here in the north, it, it's food prices are so like astronomically ridiculously high. Like it's uh, it's hard to kind of understand um, unless you like live it, but you know, you can't rely on the grocery store because it's so expensive and it's, you know, it's not as healthy. It's not as good. It's usually like prepackaged kind of stuff. It's not, um, it's not as good as what we can hunt and, and what we can find, you know, on the land. Um, so it's really devastating to have these food webs kind of poisoned like this. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, it's not just the nutritional side, it's really that cultural connection, it's who you are, you know, as, as a people, it's your, your practices, your, your, you know, traditions, it's, it's, it's everything, it's all, you know, interconnected, so it's all very important stuff. Um, before the Muskrat Falls Dam, before the reservoir was impounded, um, Inuit in my area of Lake Melville, it was already two to 2.5 times higher uh, than the average Canadian in terms of mercury levels. Um, this is because of decades of mercury buildup from the Churchill Falls Reservoir. So that was the older dam in the 70s that Meg was referencing, reservoir the size of Ireland. Um, so even though it's 300 kilometers upstream from us, we already start with a baseline higher than, um, you know, the average Canadian. Uh, Muskrat Falls is estimated to further increase our mercury levels by 1,500%, uh, 1,500. It's just so absurd. But even more ridiculous is the fact that they're still, you know, trying to like push full steam ahead on this third dam on the same river. You know, this is only going to increase these levels even more. This is going to push Inuit into a critically dangerous level of mercury exposure. It is really, really scary living in the shadow of that. Like it, I've seen elders cry. Like that, it's so heartbreaking. You know, it's people, people you rely on, like you're, they're usually the shoulder to cry on and then for them to be just like, it's so upsetting, it's so upsetting. Um, I want to talk a bit about the overcriminalization of land and water protectors. At the height of the protests, we'll say back in 2016, um, you know, there was dozens and dozens of people charged and arrested. Um, so over the past four years, I've counted over 70. It's kind of hard to keep track, to be honest. Um, I've personally been charged and arrested twice. Uh, we've had some of our elders sent to maximum security facilities over a thousand kilometers from home, including um, when they sent Inuit grandmothers to maximum security men's prisons in Newfoundland. It just breaks my heart because like, it, I just get so frustrated knowing like, it's just injustice after injustice after injustice to send 
a grandmother to a maximum security men's prison a three hour flight away from their home. We've also seen a young woman uh, violently arrested in the middle of the night. That was right at the beginning of all of this. Um, the cop who, you know, violently arrested her later, he later received an award, a humanitarian award. It's sometimes words just don't come to me because I get so frustrated. <laughs> That's one of them. Um, and we're still being dragged through the courts. We're still being, um, you know, targeted for just trying to protect our homelands from destruction. Um, my charges personally were dropped, so I'm very grateful for that, but I still have to help pay off my legal fees. And, you know, good lawyers are really expensive. So there's a link there and we'll put it in the chat too. Um, if you have any kind of spare change, you can pass along to our fundraiser page and help get some of these legal fees down. It, 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 it's really eaten up a lot of our lives and it shouldn't have. It shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have to kind of like put your life on hold for four years just to, to try and save your home. Some other impacts on our communities, um, you know, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador they only consulted with one of the three different indigenous groups uh, in the area. So the Innu Nation, you know, they had their their consultations with, but um, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut as well as Nunatuavut have never given a free prior and informed consent. This is something that's required um, by the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And, you know, because they kind of picked the government, I mean, the provincial government picked one group to talk to and not the other two, it's, it sows a lot of distrust between people. And it, it's kind of like, you know, festering and creating these hard feelings between Indigenous groups when, you know, that's really not, that's not serving anyone. We need to work together to try and, you know, help each other out kind of thing. Um, so yeah, and, and meanwhile, you know, we have these massive mega dams in our backyard, these really long, sorry, my words are failing me a little bit here, these really long um, transmission corridors, and they're bypassing all of these communities on the south coast of Labrador. They're going so close, but they don't connect to them at all. And meanwhile, these communities are still relying on dirty diesel energy. They're using diesel generators. It doesn't make any sense to me. Nothing about this project makes any sense. Nothing about hydro makes any sense. <laughs> the final point I wanted to bring up, just because it's happening right now, uh, the Inu Nation hosts their annual elders gathering every year at Gull Island. So Gull Island is the, um, the proposed site for this third dam that they want to do. Um, and Inu from all over Natasanaan journey here. It, it's super important culturally. Uh, it's a wonderful time. I love seeing my friends there. The pictures there are lovely. Um, so that, that's happening right now as we speak on Gull Island. And that's where they want to put the dam. So like, I don't know. All of these issues that we've seen at Churchill Falls and Muskrat Falls, it's only going to get worse it's only going to be further magnified uh, by this proposed dam at Gull Island. Um, and the one at Gull Island is like on a whole other scale. You know, Muskrat Falls is massive, um, but it's only 824 megawatts. The one that they're proposing is uh, 2250 megawatts. So 2.7 times bigger, 2.7 times more awful. It's just this absurd idea that they want to even think about this after how devastating and destructive and like divisive this whole thing has been and it's tricky too because right now our well our former premier because we just got a new one like a week ago um but yeah the former premier of newfoundland and labrador has gone on the record recently just november of 2019 saying the biggest roadblock for the project has been getting electricity through quebec he says discussions are still very early, but he believes Quebec will begin to work with Newfoundland and Labrador towards making the project feasible. There's a very long history with the Churchill Falls Dam, but basically when they're talking about working together to make the project feasible, they're talking about building Gull Island, shipping the power down through Quebec and into New England, you know, 
that's what that's what's really on the line and that's why that's where you come in that's why we do these kind of discussions to really talk about um what's happening on the other end of things and what are the impacts um on the other end of these transmission lines so you have an idea what it's not truly green it's not clean it's really harmful it's really frustrating and i thank you for listening i Thank you for showing up, and I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. So, not me. I'm going to turn off screen sharing. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Meg, uh, you're up. Well, this okay. Is um, thank you. Thank you. So, yes. I'm sorry. Um, I did want to point out that we have um, another speaker tonight, in addition who was to who was on the agenda. We have John Gonzalez, and I um, think he would probably fit in great right here. So, Steve, if you wouldn't mind waiting for a few minutes, that would be great. John, did you want to say a few words? There we go. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Tatsunina Kanipuit Wampuske Mikasumi Kwanapio, many blessings. Uh, thank you for having me uh, uh, here tonight. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, whether we're talking about uh, BC Hydro and the Site C Dam or Manitoba Hydro and uh, all the generating stations along the Nelson River and, uh, and Hydro Quebec, th these are provincial crown corporations uh, whose policies go back to the racist doctrine of discovery. Uh, this is where all their land claims come from. And uh, our people have been pushed onto 0.2% of their land base. Uh, you know, the genocide continues. And right now there is a termination framework going on in Canada. And uh, and this is about cultural genocide. So many of our people are saying that, uh, you know, hydro has taken over where the Indian Act and residential schools have left off. And uh, there's a lot of layers and layers of trauma in these communities. Um, these are already impoverished communities. Look, our waters uh, are, are undrinkable. Uh, you know, our wildlife cannot keep up with the fluctuation of the waters or people who've been navigating those waters for thousands of years uh, are now dodging debris as they're going along in their motorboats. I thought I was going to get killed a couple of times, <laughs> but uh, I was glad I had a good, uh, you know, a good person running the boat. But, um, you know, people are hitting debris, people are falling into the waters. Um, you know, thank you, Amy, for so eloquently talking about the, the methylmercury uh, poisoning, that uh, dangerous neurotoxin, which uh, accumulates in our, in our food supply. And, um, you know, I think that it, it, it's important to understand, uh, you know, this, is a, this might be a lot for somebody who is just opposing corridors to chew on. But I think what, it's important to get a snapshot of the people that are most heavily impacted by these communities, people, you know, who, who have lived a certain way of life for thousands of years and immediately had their food supply wiped out, immediately displaced, uh, immediately put on a fraction of their land. And, uh, you know, we, right now, you know, both Canada and the United States have a truth and reconciliation obligation uh, to indigenous people. Um, you know, by way of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I think this is something that needs to be taken before the global community. I don't, I don't think it's something that will be solved within Trudeau's uh, termination for, uh, framework. Um, uh, you know, these, the devastating effects on, on the lands and on these uh, carbon sequestering boreal forests are akin to, uh, you know, the, the tar sands and uh, the vast mining operations in Canada. The most important thing is to realize is that people are dying. You know, you cut off the food supply, 
uh, you know, and the sturgeon disappear and the moose are no more. And, uh, you know, these are communities where, uh, um, you know, food, food supply, food prices are just astronomical. And, uh, you know, there is a, a great lull of, uh, of despair over these communities. We have high incidences of uh, uh, teen suicide. And, uh, you know, so I don't know if I'm taking up too much of our time. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just end with saying, uh, you know, we really, we have to say no to this Canadian hydro, say no to the uh, Champlain Hudson uh, Power Express, say no to the uh, New England Clean Energy Connect. These are not clean. These are not green. They are contributing to the cultural genocide of indigenous people. And the propaganda machine right now is telling you that this is clean and green. They're getting subsidized as clean and green. They're getting green bonds. Okay, this will not bring us to net zero. You know, it, New York is trying to bring themselves to net zero, uh, you know, by diminishing the, fr you know, the, the dirty natural frack gas that's over there. They want to bring in the hydro, and uh, they're not addressing those most heavily impacted communities, which are uh, our indigenous communities, uh, you know, all throughout Turtle Island in Canada, Pemichicamac, Labrador, uh, BC. You know, this is, uh, this is, uh, we have a big problem here. You know, this is, this is huge. And I want to thank uh, NAMRA and uh, everybody who's working so hard, uh, you know, to elevate indigenous voices. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, allies. <laughs> thank you so much, John. And um, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So we'll move on to our next speaker, Steve Brook, who is from Maine, and we'll talk about the impacts of the corridor in Maine. And of course, we're all one planet. So whether it's harming rivers and wetlands and fisheries in Maine or Canada, it's all a question and it's all a price of uh, this Canadian hydro. So Steve will introduce himself. Thank you very much. Let's start off with my first slide. And I, I, I'm gonna talk in two parts on this program tonight. I'm gonna start by talking about the Northeast Energy Connect corridor across Maine and how it uh, really is is, is a, a disaster ecologically within the Maine. And I think it's fascinating to hear from the indigenous voices and now to understand that what's happening now is we're uh, facing the same issues uh, here in the United States as industry seeks to really set these programs going. Uh, can you get that full slide up rather than the, the, um, the overview of it? You'll have to get uh, the PowerPoint working, because only a portion of it shows. Uh, my, my point in the first slide is that, uh, that's the second slide. We have to go back one slide and we need to get rid of the, the, that's much better, thank you. So there are two, two images here. The one on the right shows the, the, the mapping of the corridor that comes to bring Hydro-Quebec power down into the lower main grid to be delivered to the Boston market. And, and, and the map on the left talks about really a, a, an important 2015 assessment that shows in bright pink uh, where the brook trout habitat is clean and it's really protected by the forest that surrounds it. As it goes to blue and later to red, it, it, it degrades and it degrades and it degrades. And I, I think it's really important to understand that when um, Ibadrola from Spain and Central Maine Power, who are the same, set this corridor up, they intentionally put it into the wilds of Maine, thinking that there'd be nobody there to complain. And, and in fact, they're really destroying the last of what's left of, of clean habitat for fisheries in our state of Maine. Let's go to the next slide, please. The NECEC route, the next slide, please. The NECEC route, um, crosses into a, a, an area of sub-watersheds that is going to come up in the next set of slides. And the, the, there, there are sub-watersheds that, that show a lot of detail of exactly where the fishery is. Um, I don't know who's working on the slides, please. Can we please go to the next slide? The slide over here. Anya, are you having trouble? Yeah, is it not 
forwarding slides? No. no We're on slide number five now. No, okay. we need to go to slide number two, please. No. Is that the right slide now? We're not seeing it in That's slide number one still. We need to go to slide number two, please. There we go. Thank you very much. And if it's possible to hit the same the, just the position of the of the power of the map that goes across the state. And over here in the area where the, the corridor goes down and starts to go through it, you're crossing a lot of these sub watersheds where the brook trout population is so special. Uh, the bright green and the and, and the lesser green are the areas that we're really co concerned about protecting if we're going to protect the brook trout population here in Maine. Let's go to the next slide, please. And as we go down into the area of the corridor, on the next slide, please. Sorry, I'm just having some technical difficulties. I'm Thank you very there. much. As we go to the next slide, what we're going to see is a detailed map that starts to show all of the detail of the watersheds that this corridor crosses. And remember that this is not just a straight little line on the map. This is actually a 300 foot wide corridor. That's a corridor the size of the New Jersey Turnpike through forested rural Maine. And the watershed that we're looking at here on the Moose River, there are 18 separate stream crossings. And in the next slide that we're going to look at, the Coal Stream Project, we invested eight and a half million dollars of public funds to protect all of these streams. And now we have this enormous project that's going to come crossing it all. Uh, two crossings in a tenth of a mile, nine tenths of a mile. And then it parallels a lot of the important habitat that we're working to protect. Let's go to the next slide, please. When Central Maine Power set up and, and, and started talking about what was being done here, they said, oh, there'll be absolutely no impact on any of the public lands. And this is an area of public lands. There are two public lots and the, the corridor actually comes down, crosses over the, the habitat we're trying to protect and then bisects these two lots. So in long segments of the, this corridor, it runs parallel to the protected water that's to protect the habitat along the stream for brook trout. So it's, it's very frustrating to see that Central Maine Power and Ibadrola have, have used a portion of a unique zone in our state with intact, intact brook trout habitat to design and to build their corridor on. Let's go to the next slide, please, if we can. So this is the northeast corner of where the public lots are. And there's already a road that crosses the area. And now you're going to layer onto the road the, the corridor and the layering on layer upon layer of habitat degradation for an area that's supposed to be protected. Let's go to the next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide, please? Has it forwarded to the next slide? Yes, this is the public lands along Tom Hegan. Again, you can see nine stream crossings, all in little blue lines, all are going to destroy the habitat that we're working so hard to protect, to protect brook trout. Again, very discouraging and very discouraging to find that Central Maine Power has chosen a route that specifically goes into areas that have been designed for habitat. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this is the one that really bothers me because we, we passed a law a year ago, a couple of years ago in the state of Maine to create state heritage fish waters where the waters and the fish in these waters receive extra protected status. Yet here we have a, a central Maine power corridor coming through exactly where the spawning habitat is. And in the map that central Maine power created, they've got a lot of the stream crossings, but none of them have all of the unmapped springs that enable spawning habitat for the brook trout. Let's go to the last slide, please. And the next one. It looks like that's the last one on this slide deck. Do you want me to switch to the next one? 
Well, I guess I'll just I'll wrap this up. This is a lot of detail that goes into impacts that are ecological for brook trout. And spawning habitat is a real rarity. And to have central main power and Ibadrola intentionally locating their corridor where we're trying to protect the habitat, it, 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 it is in, it's just ingenuous of them. Uh, they're lying to us outright when they say that they're creating no impact on the habitat that we're working. So let's move to the next set of slides because I think this is going to really add to what we've heard today. I'm going to look at the next set of slides, please, Anya. We're going to want to talk about dams. And we're going to be talking about dams from little teeny small ones, like the one right here, where we have habitat that's being fragmented with culverts. And it, and it really doesn't matter how minor the impacts are when you're talking about water ecosystems. Dam impacts like this extend miles upstream and downstream because it disrupts all of the ecology that's in the river system. Let's go to the next slide, please. Aquatic biology is really very complex. You can get advanced degrees in enormous detail of individual insects within this ecological environment. But the more we study these systems, the more we learn about just how complex they are and even more important, all of the species that evolved over thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, they are co-evolved and they support each other. Each one is part of the other species. So it's very difficult to talk about the impact of a single species. Let's go to the next slide, please. As, as you have a watershed that comes down from the mountains, as you locate dams at any location on this watershed, you get enormous significant impact. On my local river, the Kennebec River, the river is full of freshwater mussels. And freshwater mussels live in a system that's in essence a one-way system. All of the water goes downstream, yet these mussels are enabled to inhabit the entire ecosystem simply because they they're, have co-evolved with the, the freshwater fish that come in and the saltwater fish that come in in the spring. The mussels release their spat into the column of water and it attaches to the gills of the fish that are migrating through the system. So they, they ride upstream with the fish that are coming in from the ocean. Uh, the impacts of dams breaks all of this into multiple fragments of the ecological community. And so when you have one dam, you, you destroy a section of the river if the dam is lower down on the river close to the ocean where the sea run fish are blocked from coming in, the actual impact is far greater. Let's go to the next slide, please. Not all dams are created the same. Here in Maine, we have a lot of older dams that are called run of river dams. These are dams where the, the flow of the river is contained partially in a head pond, but whatever comes into the head pond goes down and quickly joins the river back down. So the regular flow cycle of the river can be continued. Uh, this is not like the big Canadian hydro dams that block and flood enormous areas and store the water from one season to the next. Let's go to the next slide because I think this is something that's really important to focus on. This is the annual flow of the Kennebec River taking very close to my home. And in the winter, you'll get a little bit of water coming out, but it's really the spring freshen. In May, June, as it tapers off at the end of June and into July, this is when a lot of the ecological activity and all of the, the river system comes alive and is refreshed. In the summertime, the flows decrease, decrease, decrease. And this year, they're even lower than we have here because we're in the middle of an enormous drought. We hope sometime in November, the flows will come and we'll get another shot of water. And again, the rivers will rise. This is all feet of elevation on the left scale and time on the bottom scale. So the varying flow of a river over the course of the cycle of a year is something that's very important to all of the creatures that have gone and evolved in this river system. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is, this is in Waterville, Maine, close to where I live. 
And these are old run of river dams that were built as part of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution started by making hydromechanical power. And around the turn of the 20th century, in the early 20th century, electrical generators replaced the mechanical tools. But the impacts are set, still the same here in Maine and in Canada as well. They block migratory species, they disrupt and eliminate the natural river system. The impoundments cause the water to heat over the course of the summer and discharge in the fall when they should be discharging colder water. And these small dams have a really big impact ecologically for a very small amount of power. This dam, for example, generates about three megawatts, only three megawatts of power. When you compare that to the numbers that we heard earlier about the big Canadian modern dams, these are just drops in the bucket electricity wise. And this is one of the reasons that we removed a dam just downstream of this one from the Kennebec River and we're working on others right now. Let's go to the next dam, please. Next slide, please. So the Canadian mega dams are enormous. They're unlike anything we have in the United States. Those of us that live here in the States have no points of reference on the scale of these enormous structures. And it was really shortly after the end of World War II that Canada began to really start building major dams all along its waterways that were down along the US border. And I think that these dams have all of the ecological problems that we've seen with the smaller dams that I talked about earlier, but they're even worse with these enormous dams that impact the whole of Quebec and further west Manitoba and also Saskatchewan as well as Labrador. Let's go to the next slide, please. Just this summer, a new publication has come out. I think we really want to pay attention to this one because this, this is a book that was published by activists in Maine and it goes to the actual impacts of these enormous Canadian hydro dams, these mega dams, and it's new technology and it's new understandings of ecology. And it was really developed a lot of this. It's because these Canadian dams are designed for perpetuity. They're designed to be there forever. They're not like American dams that have to be relicensed every 40 years or less. We're, as we relicense them, we have a chance to attack the ecological damage and we can get rid of them one by one. But Canada has a very different governmental system so that these dams are really built for perpetuity. This book has a lot of controversial information in it. And a lot of the conservation and controversial information is gonna be challenged by Hydro-Quebec. But th there are some parts of it that I think are really true and that I'd never thought of before and I'd like to share them with you. Let's go to the next slide, please. When we talk about the St. Lawrence River and the effluent of the St. Lawrence River, there was a Dr. Hans New, who was a research science at the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans at the Bedford Institute in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And he started looking at how the river as it comes out and it joins the salt water of the sea develops what's called a salt water wedge. Let's go to the next slide, please. And the, the details of how the, the salt water wedge works are complicated. There's a, a halcyon line that is the actual boundary between the salt water that's heavier underneath and the fresh water that's on the surface. But let's go to the next slide, please. The, the, the whole issue is the turbidity and the currents that come in to affect all, as all of these different currents meet. It's important because the turbidity brings fresh saltwater nutrients from the depth of the ocean. And Dr. New discovered that these uh, salt wedges can extend as much as 200 miles offshore. So let's take a look at the next slide, please, because we, we, we can see what happened on the St. Lawrence River system. Uh, early in the 1970s and late 60s, big dams began to be built on the St. Lawrence. And the flow of the nutrients that comes out in the salt wedge through the Gulf of uh, St. Lawrence into the North Atlantic, where all of the cod populations were, was shut off. And at the same time, all of the cod populations that Europeans came to North America for 
just disappeared and nobody has ever understood where did these populations go? And I think that it's increasingly clear that it was the Canadian dams that were put in on the St. Lawrence River that impacted all of these offshore fisheries and has caused the economic collapse of most of Atlantic Canada. And it's, it's dramatic. And this is just new information that's coming to light that really builds to the indigenous people's stories from the North. Let's go to the last slide, please. Because these enormous Canadian dams that have been built all across Canada, they have extraordinary, extensive in impact. They flood extensive lands, they force indigenous communities to mo move away from their ancestral homelands. I, I'm pretty convinced that the dams in, in, in hydro Quebec have flooded the migratory routes of the caribou herds. And that one of the reasons that the Happy Valley group of, uh, of Native Americans have not had caribou up in their world is because they, the migratory paths are now blocked by the, the, these mega dams. Uh, changes in flow of all of these have disrupted the ecosystem enormously. The First Nation people can no longer use the frozen rivers to travel on in winter, to travel to their winter hunting grounds. The river ice is multi-layered with each little flow that the dams release, little skims of ice form, but there is no solid ice, which would be the normal situation with a, a free flowing river where the, the flows decrease and stabilize in winter. And I think the disruption of these is gonna be impacting the saltwater wedge that goes into James Bay and to the Arctic Ocean. And I think that that's going to be a, a very significant impact on the offshore fisheries as well as the onshore fisheries. Let's go on and talk about the impoundments that we have here. Uh, we've heard a little bit about the methylmercury. Methylmercury forms in what's called a littoral zone. And the littoral zone is where light penetrates. Many of these great impoundments are very shallow. And so when the sunlight hits the bottom, the metallic mercury that's present everywhere in this ecosystem is methylized. It, it, it adds a, a molecule to it so it can be bioaccumulated. And we've heard about how this works its way up the food chain from Amy. I mean, it is incredible to think that the Canadian government is setting up ecosystems that poison the indigenous people that live there. And I think that the other thing that's increasingly clear that, that the new book, Blue uh, Deserts, is beginning to point out is that the impact of warm water discharges into this Arctic environment is very likely having an enormous impact on sea ice. And we, we hear about the, the Arctic opening up in winter and that it's climate change, but I think a lot of it is the presence of these dams. And as the sea ice disappears, it impacts the polar bears and all of the peoples that live in the northern end of the ice pack. I mean, it's incredible to see how this is all going on. And then you have open ocean water in the Arctic, which adds heat to it, which really impacts global warming in ways that we do not yet understand. Let's go to the last slide, please. I think that this last slide you've seen before, and it really talks about the interconnectivity and it all reaching down now towards the United States. And what we're hearing from Central Maine Power and I Bedroller is that they want to draw this big line across Maine, a 300 foot wide corridor, not for one power line, but we're going to see multiple lines along this corridor if it's permitted. The ecological and social impact of the large Canadian mega dams on the electrical power they generate, make the power anything but green. This is the dirtiest power imaginable. This is the deal with the devil, where they're sacrificing all of the peoples of the North, all of the ecosystems of the North, for the electricity that they think that they can sell into the United States. So my objection to the Spanish-owned power line to bring dirty hydropower from Quebec down goes be well beyond the ecological damage to the brook trout that means so much to me. Canadian mega dam power is simply too dirty to be imported to the United States. And it's up to all of us to work together, educate the American people to understand this disaster that we are supporting. Thank you very much.
and I'll pass this on to the next speaker. Uh, thank you so okay. much. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Becky. No, go ahead, Becky. So I just want to thank all of the speakers so much. It's really informative. Um, and I, we were, were happy to take questions. Um, I think the best thing to do is to put them in the chat if you have any. Um, and um, I also see that in the chat, there are a number of people who would like to have the book. So I would say you can either get in touch with um, uh, main.chapter at sierraclub.org is an email for our address or coordinator.namra, namra at gmail.com uh, and give us your uh, contact information to, so we can get a book to you. Um, so uh, then I uh, just wanted to see if there are any other questions. Has anybody raised a uh, hand on a question? No, you can, can we mute? I mean, can we unmute people? If you want to unmute yourself, you could identify yourself and ask a question as well. I'm seeing messages here, but I'm not seeing questions. Becky, you have a question from Catherine Skopik. She's oh, raising okay. her hand. Great. I Go ahead, Rachel. Thank you um, very much. I enjoyed that and learned so very much from all of you. What is the best thing one can do um, to stop this? Uh, uh, here in New York City, I know both Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo seem to be for this project. And I've begun to fight with others and uh, to bring the issue forward to the general public. Uh, what do you recommend as the best kind of action to stop it right now before it goes any further? Can I uh, step in for that? Please. Sure. Uh, well, most recently, uh, we just released a film and we had a press conference addressing uh, the Coalition uh, of North uh, Eastern Governors. Uh, who are meeting with the premiers of Quebec, uh, or not just Quebec, but all the uh, Eastern premiers. And they come together to discuss uh, energy policies uh, that will potentially tether us to head, uh, hydro for the next 40 to 60 years. Uh, here in the state of Rhode Island, Governor Gina Raimondo is one of those governors. Uh, Governor Cuomo in New York, he is one of those governors. Uh, Premier Legault, they're there are quite a few, I don't know all their names, but um, I would say, you know, get in touch with, uh, uh, you know, your governor or your premier and, um, you know, demand, uh, help us demand representation uh, on things that are gonna impact us. You know, we, uh, indigenous peoples need uh, free prior and informed consent, and uh, we have the right to self-determination. And um, so, that's a good place to start. And of course, the North American uh, uh, Mega Dams Resistance Alliance, you know, and, and uh, Juanice Catan. You can get in touch with, with uh, anybody from those two organizations. Uh, they're doing a lot of wonderful things for uh, hydro impacted communities. Thank you. What's the governor's group called again? The governors that meet Northeastern? That's the uh, Coalition yeah. of Northeastern Governors. CONIG uh, okay. is the acronym. Thank and, you very uh, much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Danny. Yeah, and thanks, John. And, and this is Meg. I would add with regard to New York City, um, get involved in some of the activity around um, demanding that Mayor de Blasio have a transparent pro procurement process for renewable energy. There are secret negotiations going on right now behind closed doors with um, Mayor de Blasio and Hydro-Quebec and Blackstone Group, which is the uh, international financier that is trying to push through CHIPI. They have a uh, permit process going on in front of the Public Service Commission. So there's lots to do there and there are lots of groups we can put you in touch with that if you're with 350 or some of the other groups in New York City, um, we can give you more details about that. 
I'm in, I'm in Sierra Club and I know people in 350 and a couple other people as well. So we'll start to gain Great. strength in joining each other. Also, I just want to mention that Great. For, Thank you. for those people on the call um, who are in Maine, Sierra Club has an energy uh, team and we are working very hard to continue to stop this effort um, on the part of uh, CMP. So uh, you can get in touch with us uh, at maine.chapter at sierraclub.org and we'll be happy to ha have you join the team. Also writing letters to the editor because the fight is not over yet. We have a lot of uh, pending lawsuits uh, that are happening uh, in, on the state level. And so uh, join us if you like, and we will continue to do this, the, this work in Maine. Thank you, Becky. Can I ask a question? Um, oh yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'll go after. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, oh, please. I'm sorry. I couldn't see anybody else's hand up. Do you want to go, please? No, please go ahead and I'll go after you. That's okay. Please. So my question is a little bit speaking of frustration. You know, I work to stop a pipeline near me, West Roxbury Lateral and Massachusetts. And then, you know, folks were getting blown down today, literally um, in Weymouth um, with the gas pipelines and the compressor and you know it's always a game of perceived and fake perceived energy need and I know that when we were doing our work in West Roxbury you know there was always this oh my god the old ladies of West Roxbury they're going to be cold they're going to have to put on a sweater in the winter they're going to lose their heat you know this kind of game of like pretending that we care about the people and I just hope that we can counteract that successfully, you know, because those little old ladies, so to speak, as they were referred to by the companies, were the first people out on the line protesting these, these pipelines here. And I just get really, really tired of this fake perceived we're running out of energy need. Um, and I'm wondering how we can counteract that um, you know, because it's, we all know it's about making the big money, um, but yet they do such a great job of this pretend need for energy. So if somebody can just comment on that. I can quickly mention that ISO New England is the one, is, is an organization that, um, you know, all of New England. Oh, I know is, ISO. <laughs> right, so ISO New England, we need to be writing a letter to the editor about questioning what their science is because they, I don't believe it's based in science. Um, we, have, I, I, we have a question uh, for Steve. Um, if you can elaborate around the science of the warming ocean from holding back water and the fisheries, what groups are working on this, um, do, uh, like Gulf of Maine Research or CLF? Do you know? I, I, I honestly don't know of a lot of groups that are working hard on this at this point. You know, I, I think that the Russians have done more research about this because they actually use some of this discharge to break up ice in some of their communities all along the north of Siberia. Um, this is really embryonic science. This is impacts that nobody anticipated to find from these mega dams. And, um, CMP and Iberdrola and Hydro-Quebec and all of the provincial power companies are going to argue against it saying, oh, there's no information, there's nothing there. I think we've got a long way of go and a lot of unknown science to really make this charge stick, but it's, but it's common sense. A lot of science you can look at and understand the mechanism and how it works. So we need to get oceanography involved in the impacts of these large dams, disrupting the river cycles, discharging warm water into the Arctic and helping to break up the Arctic ice, which really is a cause of an enormous amount of ecological change that we have no idea and no understanding of at this point. Thank you, Steve. Um, I just wanted to say um, something about the people of the feather in the James Bay area. Those folks are, have uh, put together a film about the 
warming water that lays on the on the ice where the ducks and all can't uh, go down and get the food that they uh, traditionally have. So there's a lot of there's a lot more information that maybe we all should get put together again as we go forward in the next couple of months to uh, point out some of the other um, issues that are involved. Uh, and especially, I know we've had the um, Dr. Hagen on and so forth, but I think it bears repeating because we, we all have these questions. <clears throat> Thanks. I guess. Um, thank you, thank Joan. You. Tina, go ahead, Regina, you're next. Oh, okay, thank you. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Yes, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask um, Meg or maybe Becky, both of you, uh, the question of going back to New York City, which is where I'm from, and, um, and, and uh, the, one of the last speakers of, uh, from New York, um, uh, we're, you know, we work, we have been working to, trying to work together on this to begin something. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, in the way that the, that the mayor has been working secretly to pull this off and uh, get it done by the end of the year, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, the, certainly there's the, the city council, I don't know if it's involved at all in this, but certainly willing to bring it to the, you know, the, the environmental committee at the uh, city council. Um, Meg, have you, have you spoken to them um, yet? Um, have you spoken to anybody at the city council uh, about this? Um, in New York, I mean. Um, no, I have not. Um, I think that other folks, perhaps within Sierra Club or um, from some other groups in New York, have been in touch with the city council, but I have not. Okay, all right. So it, it's a there's no reason not to go back to them and with more and more information. Um, um, there's so much material that you all of you have brought out, which, which is really fabulous. And so um, I think we need to maybe with your help, develop a, a, a stronger strategy for doing something in, in the city. Uh, and um, uh, um, Kath, Catherine and I are certainly involved and there are other pe certainly other people too. But um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best if we can. Um, and if you have any suggestions for us, we are all ears and ready to, you know, uh, ready to engage and follow some of your suggestions. Thank you. John, I wonder if Great, John Thank Gonzalez, you so much. Um, I was just thinking in an answer to that, sorry, Meg, but I'm wondering if John Gonzalez can put in the chat yes. the, the uh, link to the film. Oh, yeah, it'd be good, yeah. Um, because that's a very useful tool. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Regina, this is Annie. I gave Hello. you a little card at the yeah. march on Sunday, and you're always welcome to call me. You do have my number. Right, yes, yes, right. of course. So, right. Call me up. <laughs> okay, yes, okay. Uh, we need to do something as a <clears throat> group collective. Okay. Um, where is the, um, I can't find, okay, let me find the chat, okay. Chat's down in the bottom bar, and um, and so it will be put in there in a second, I think. John oh, okay. okay, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions that I miss any? I guess there was one question about um, whether CLF and Gulf of Maine scientists are working on this. And I just want to mention that we have um, spoken to them, but they have declined to, um, to look into this, the science of this. Oh, what a drag. Yeah. Okay. So can I ask another question if, if other folks are done? Sure, let me know. So, um, in terms of uh, First Nations people in the states um, intervening, um, and this is not my belief, but I'm just curious how the governments work. Do you have to be either state or federally recognized um, for that intervention to be able to have 
standing within the either the state government, the federal government, or you know these companies. Um, this is Meg. I'll take a. Whoops. Go ahead. Go for it. I'll take a stab at that. Um, I, it sounds a bit like a legal questioning. A legal question. I'm not an expert in um, Indian law, but um, you know, over the years there have been comments submitted to different state and federal agencies, as I mentioned, you know, the Penobscot tribe in Maine submitting comments to the New England Clean Energy Connect. In my view, part of the problem is that the laws that they're commenting under, such as the National Environmental Policy Act and others, um, you know, theoretically stop at the border. And that is the position that the federal agencies are taking which says, you know, we don't have to look at any of the impacts of these dams or where this electricity is coming from, which is really an egregious situation. And in particular in New York City, where you have the Climate Leadership and Protection Act, which um, Hydro-Quebec is citing to, as well as Blackstone and TDI, and trying to push this corridor through as clean energy, citing to this law that has a very, very strong climate justice uh, uh, goal and requirements. The law says the clean energy plan of the state is supposed to benefit frontline uh, environmental justice communities, yet the impacts in Canada are being ignored. So, um, you know, that's part of the problem. And if an Indigenous community here in the U.S. was not in the line of fire of a particular corridor, they wouldn't have standing to be able to go to court. Um, I know there might be a, a lawyer on here, Kevin might want to weigh in on that, but that would be my take at this point. Kevin, do you want to add anything? Kevin Cassidy from Earthrise Law Center. Yeah, sure, Meg, thanks. Um, you know, it, it depends a little bit. I think, uh, uh, what you know, I'm more, I'm most familiar with federal court actions uh, that challenge these types of corridors uh, under the the law that that Meg just mentioned, NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, or sometimes under the Clean Water Act, and um, and if there, you know, there's certainly if there are uh, if uh, I guess. First Nations or Indian uh, tribes in Maine that have that are impacted, like the Penobscot, and they've submitted comments to the core. And there's a there's a federal action that is is filed uh, challenging the corridor. Uh, they may uh, be able to join that through intervention, and they may have standing if they can show um, that their interests are going to be harmed. But as Meg says. Uh, unfortunately, the courts have interpreted some of these laws as as not looking beyond the borders of of the U.S., which is um, doesn't make a lot of sense in the in the context of greenhouse gases, certainly, uh, and and those kinds of impacts. And it also doesn't make a lot of sense when you are looking at a, at a transmission project, which is clearly connected. Um, to to northern parts of Canada, so um, so I, I think there are there are opportunities potentially depending on how it unfolds in Maine, um, and I'd be you know happy to talk to anyone uh, you know who who might be more interested in in uh, in that and and exploring that possibility. I think those those are voices that that the Army Corps uh, needs to hear from as much as possible. Hi, Amy here. Um, I just want to jump just, in. Sorry. Go, go, Amy. No, go ahead. I just I want to jump in real quick and say that, um, you know, when we're talking about borders and jurisdictions and like that kind of thing, this is precisely how, you know, these colonial port systems work against us because they did it with Muskrat Falls in that when they did their so-called environmental assessment, they 
took this very harsh line at the mouth of the river and said there will be absolutely no effects past the mouth of the river. We know that's not true. Like that doesn't make any sense. It's not like the mercury in the water is going to magically disappear when it floats past a certain point. Right. So I think a lot of this, it's important to talk about, but it's important to kind of keep in mind that that's how these systems work and they're working as they were designed to work in that they're working to, you know, rob us from our lands and territories and from our sovereignty. Okay. I mean, like in Massachusetts, you know, the state is named for the Massachusetts and yet they don't even have recognition, you know? And so like, if they wanna stand up and say things, you know, when you don't have that fake federal game recognition, you don't get to say things and have the, have standing. So I'm just kind of wondering um, if well, we people's in Maine being affected who are not necessarily federally recognized, which I think is such a ridiculous system, and how they're able to stand up for themselves. Good point. I can't really answer that, but we do have um, Melissa Ferretti is the chair lady and president of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe from Plymouth, Massachusetts on the phone. And Melissa, if you want to take a minute and talk about your efforts joining with the Penobscot and the Innu of Labrador and opposing the New England Clean Energy Connect in the last couple of weeks, that would be great. Sure. Oops. Okay. I think she might. She's muted. Yeah, I, mute. I thought I was unmuted. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I okay. Mean, we we're a we're a state recognized tribe as well, and I I do understand how the Massachusetts feel. Um, you you tend to be not taken quite as seriously. I I think sometimes if you're not federally recognized, which I agree with um with you that you know it's 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 preposterous and it's it it just doesn't even make sense. But I think as a tribal nation who is passionate about these type of issues, it's just really important to stand up anyhow and mm -hmm. to speak your mind and, and address these issues and support as, as we did other, other tribal, communi uh, tribal communities to stop these dams. So I, I think, you know, we wrote a strong letter to support um, the Inuit and the and the Penobscot Nation, and I I encourage all tribal communities to do the same. I think it's it's you know you you really just have to make noise and 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 people listen when we take you seriously. You just have to stick up for yourselves. I I think is you know really my point there. If that helps at all. Thank you. Yes, Thank and you. I, I do this is, okay. go ahead. Oh, I'm, this I'm is Meg, to... I'll add to that. I'm sorry. Go, sorry, go, sorry. go Meg, go Meg. All I'm right. Just aware of the time. Um, I'll add to that um, with the North and the Northern Pass Transmission Corridor, which was, you know, a twin to CMP and to Chippy, the New York Corridor. Um, three U.S. tribes did write to Governor Baker opposing that. Um, in 2018. So um, people here on the other side of the border have been standing in solidarity with indigenous and frontline communities in Canada. And I believe they'll continue to do that. Yeah. Yeah, just keep on, keep your head high and you know, you just have to, you just have to assert that right and just claim it and, and don't let anybody tell you any different. That's all I can suggest. and. We'll be here to support our brothers and sisters as long as they need us. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you everybody for being on the call tonight. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm aware of the time. We have a couple of other things that we want to talk about. Um, we have an action slide, which I think Anya can put up, actions you can take. Um, the Sierra Club Maine will be developing a, uh, or actually we're gonna uh, have a strategic planning session to um, in, with our energy team. And if anyone is interested in joining the ener energy team, please um, send a message to the chapter at maine. I don't see that's on here, at maine 
dot chapter at sierraclub.org. Um, and it is really valuable to email um, or write a letter to the governors. Um, it, they have not allowed us to speak with them, but more people need to, you know, contact them and say that we, uh, we really oppose this project. Governor Mills in particular, you know, ran, sent, ran saying that she would evaluate the project and, you know, shortly thereafter being elected, she, you know, um, moved forward on it. And I think, you know, we need to tell her that we need to hold up the mirror to her. So anyway, thank you so much um, for this. Uh, please take action. Please write to the governors and uh, you can join us or in, thank you for the Connecticut and, and New York members who have joined as well as um, Amy and John Gonzalez and Melissa um, and Steve. Um, it's been wonderful to hear from you and uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Um, we have a, there's a, we have another slide just to let you know is that we have another conversation about the lack of transparency and the money involved in the pursuit of big hydro on October 27th. So um, I think there's a slide that will come up on that. Um, but it, uh, so keep look for that um, in your inbox. And um, again, this is, this is Sierra Club, Maine, October 27th another one of these evening events. So um, please feel free to join us. And uh, thank you so much, Steve, Amy, John, Melissa, Meg, um, and uh, who am I missing? I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Becky. And thanks we, thank you, Becky, for hosting. Thank you, thank you Becky. <laughs> and yeah. Anya as well. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Take Anya. care.